In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for His infinite love, mercy, and compassion, for giving us another opportunity being in His Holy Church at St. Shimon Bar Sabai and St. Mary's Cathedral and another Bible preach session. We pray that you are always in good health and in good spirit, um, strong in your faith and in your love for Jesus Christ, the one and only. He is the reason for the season. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. So if I could ask you all to stand for the Lord's Prayer, if you don't mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at, at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and evermore. Amen. Please be seated. Well, it's another exciting <clears throat> Friday evening at 7 p.m. all the way from Sydney, Australia. Those who live in Sydney, a big hello. Those who live in Melbourne, a even bigger hello. And those who live in Australia, um, in this wonderful country of ours, may the Lord Jesus bless you always. And those who are watching us live from abroad, overseas, wherever you may be, America, Canada, Europe, and maybe in the Middle East and other parts of the world, may the Lord Jesus always be with you, guide you, protect you, and deliver you from every evil, evil tribulation, whether it be visible and or invisible. In Jesus' mighty name, may you always be saved. Now, before we come into our session of this evening, I'll leave you with this uh, church hymn. Let us all come in contemplation and listen to these beautiful lyrics.
to that standing here in victory knowing that you've done it all the great I am absolutely this is the way every Christian need to believe in the great I am who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth all glory to his holy name we standing here in victory knowing that you my Lord the great I am have done it all Absolutely, this is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is God, revealed in the flesh. Just before we go on to our topic, a reminder, 
um, next, fr- next Wednesday again uh, with these uh, free food hampers that we have been uh, giving out to families that have been struggling throughout these pandemics and lockdowns, uh, especially here in, in the western um, suburbs of Sydney and, and other LGAs that have been affected by the um, lockdowns. But we pray these lockdowns will be over and done with before we know it, our beloveds. So next Wednesday, there will be another uh, free food hampers uh, giving at 12 p.m. here at the church's location. Another thing, um, starting from next Wednesday again, uh, we are starting a new program uh, called uh, Spirit of a Servant. Spirit of a Servant. It will commence uh, from next Wednesday and it will be on a weekly basis every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Spirit of a Servant. I encourage you, my beloveds, all of you are watching us, Please, if you have any questions, send them to the email address that is appearing on the screen. Send all your questions that you may have, the concerns that you may have, and with the Lord's grace, we will uh, start addressing them and answering all your questions uh, starting from next Wednesday at 7 p.m. at a new program called Spirit of a Servant. Continuing with our topic, Journey with Christ, um, I believe uh, today is the eighth topic um, under that title, Journey with Christ. Last Friday, we spoke about, um, as Christians, are we obligated to adhere to government God, and therefore, as Christians, as believers in God, we need to these governments and their rules, sin. And we, we talked quite in depth last Friday, um, and we quoted from the um, uh, Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. Uh, and the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans 13, 1 to 2, how St. Paul talks that we need to adhere to government bodies and their, uh, their rules and their, and their regulations and their laws, since they are established by God. And we did mention that when you read the Holy Bible, you need to look at other areas where it mentions about um, being submissive uh, to your authorities. But above all, the Holy Bible is very clear in saying that God needs to be um, adhered to more than men. God is the ultimate Uh, government. God is the ultimate authority. He is the ultimate ruler. He reigns over everyone and everything. So God needs to be respected and adhered to more than any government on earth and any human on earth. And uh, we said that in the book of Genesis, which is chapter 3, and this has been our actually journey and uh, the journey with Christ, a, a topic, it was Genesis chapter 3. And we said there are 10 points that took place in the Garden of Eden of Genesis 3. And speaking of governments last week, today number 4, the number 4th point out of the 10, and that was when God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, Genesis 1.26. And God gave the dominion to this man. He said, you will have the dominion over everything on this planet. And last Friday, just to remind ourselves that since Adam, which is all of us, we are all Adam, since we chose not to have God as the ruler over our life, God left us to seven dispensations. He left us to seven dispensations to rule over our life. And we said dispensation in the specific sense, it is a system of revealed commands and promises regulating human affairs. It is a system of revealed commands and promises regulating the human affairs. And the seven dispensations were Number one, innocence. And that was at the time in in the Garden of Eden. For as long as Adam 
was living in Eden in the presence of the Almighty God. They saw themselves naked and they were ashamed and they hid themselves behind the tree. And the Lord God came walking in the garden and called, Adam, where are you? Adam said, I am hiding behind the tree because I am naked and I am ashamed to come out and show my nakedness to you, God. He said, who told you you are naked? Looks like you've broken my word and you've eaten from the forbidden tree. They got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Innocence was lost could not manage the affairs of the human race since we brought God's word. Then after the Garden of Eden, the six days of creations, the seventh day God rested from what he had created. The six days of creation, when we read in Genesis 1 and 2, it talks about the other six dispensations. Each day speaks of a system ruling over our life. Since we denied the rulership of God, other systems came to rule over us. In other words, we left God no other choice but to leave us with these systems to rule over our life. Day one, the conscience. Day two, governments. Day three, patriarchs. Day four, the law covenant between God and man, the Old Testament. Day five, the grace covenant between, between the Father and the Son, the New Testament. And day six, the fullness of times, the second coming of Christ the King. And then day seven, God rested and from everything he had done. And we spoke about day two. Day two was government. Day one, conscience. Innocence failed. God gave me another system to rule over my life. God said to Adam and all of us, he said, I'll leave you with your conscience. Let your conscience rule over your life. What happened with the conscience didn't last very long. Cain got up and killed his brother, his own brother, Abel. He killed him. And then when the Lord God came to Cain, where is your brother Cain? He said, what am I, a protector of my brother? You go and search for him. He said, but his blood is crying out to me. You've killed your brother. Why did you do that? Well, when I shut my conscience, when I um, turn it off, I can kill anyone and everyone. When the conscience day one failed, day two came, day two governments. When I could not rule my life by myself, I failed to manage my own affairs. God left me for another human being to rule over my own affairs. And the other human being, they are called government. And that was day two. Day two, God called it nothing. And we spoke about this. Day one, day three, four, five, and six, he called it good. But day six called it very good. Day two, God called it absolutely nothing. Meaning, God says to all of us, the day that comes a human rules over another human, that day is wiped, is wiped from my book is white from my time. I do not recognize that day when a human rules over another human. You know why? Because a human being ruling over another human being outside the circle of God, outside the sovereignty of God, outside the presence of God, it is nothing but evilness and wickedness. And we saw that in Ecclesiastes 3.16, King Solomon being a government, he said, Moreover, I saw under the sun, in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. 
And when we look at government and judicial system, you always see shortfalls and failures and wrong laws being passed and injustice being served. Because a human ruling another human outside the guidance of God, it's going to be evil. So when people say governments are from God, we need to adhere to them. Yes, that's true. Governments are from God. So as everything else, the church is from God. The air is from God. The wind, the sea, the land, the birds, the fish, the stars, the universe, the galaxies, they are all from God. But God, nothing comes out of him but good. So when God established a government, he was intending for the government to protect and preserve the very rights which God gave me, not to dictate how I should live. The government's role is to protect and preserve God-given rights to me, not to be a dictator and impose unjust laws upon me. Definitely that is not of God's. And as Christians, true believers of Jesus Christ, who is the truth, when we see evil laws being passed, we have the right to oppose them and to stand against them and, and denounce them. Why? Because if we truly believe in God, then he, need, he ought to be adhered to more than anyone else on the face of this earth. God is always and ought to be the only sovereign authority over every government, over every human being, and everything that exists. Now, so we, we read the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans chapter 13 verses 1 and 2 and it spoke about adhering to governments and their authority because they are from God. But we said when you read the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans chapter 12 verse 21 which is the very first prior to 13 1. St. Paul says in 1221 do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Then he says, adhere to governments, meaning since St. Paul put that verse 1221 prior to 131, he wants to tell us something. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. St. Paul is, wants to say that governments at some stage will pass laws that are evil. Do not be overcome by, the, by those evil laws, but rather overcome them with good. And what is good? God only. There is no one good but God. Everyone has veered off the road and have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one good but God. Jesus Christ in John 10, he says, I am the good shepherd. And since there is no one good but God, then when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, good means God. So he is the only true God that I need to listen to. And through Jesus, I will overcome every evil done by governments and men on earth. Jesus is the sovereign authority. When the government is evil, Christians must oppose it. When political leaders are evil, Christians must oppose them. Because the truth always prevails. Lies are only short-lived. The truth remains forever. As a further example, let us turn our attention to the life of Saint and the Apostle St. Peter. St. Peter and John the Beloved, they had spent the night in the jail for preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead. The next morning, they appeared in court before a Jewish governing body called the Sanhedrin. Herod was the king of the Jews 
at the time, Herod allowed the Sanhedrin to continue its operation in exchange for its support of his government. Meaning, you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, Sanhedrin. So Sanhedrin, you do whatever I want, I'll let you do whatever you want. Church and politics never mix. Christ and the world never mix. For he is the light of the world, meaning the world is in darkness. World has been placed in the bosom of Satan. So is there any connection between light or darkness? Never. It is either light or darkness. It is either the truth or the lie. Dark, light, the truth, cannot mix with darkness, the lies. When we read in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 18, the Sanhedrin commanded Peter, St. Peter and St. John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. They commanded them. This command, of course, directly contradicted Jesus' command. The Lord Jesus told Peter and John to go and make disciples of all nations. It was a command from the Lord to Peter and John to go and make disciples of all nations. For the Sanhedrin to try and suppress them, this is against what the Lord Jesus had commanded them to do. When the Lord sent them in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, he says, go teach, uh, you know, make discipleship of all, uh, baptize them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. The Lord commanded the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. For the Sanhedrin to stop them from doing that, and if they had obeyed to this governing body, they would have broken God's law and command. God needs to come first always, not men, God first. And if anybody says, when you get the jab, you are showing an act of love for your neighbor, sorry to say this to you, this is a very deceptive way of talking and preaching, and it's a shame to talk as such being Christians. What happened to the first part of the law? Didn't, didn't the Bible teach us all to say that we need to love God first and then neighbor? What happened to the God part? Have we forgotten about that? So is it really to get a jab is an act of love for your neighbor? Where is God? If you don't love God, you can never understand or fathom how to love your neighbor like yourself. Since you and I are, are created in the image and the likeness of God, the only way we're going to understand ourselves when we find our creator. When we begin to love God who created us, then we are then only able to understand and comprehend how to love neighbor as myself. Without God, there is no love. So please stop throwing deceptive statements out there. Read the Holy Bible thoroughly and properly. Was St. Peter subject to the governing authorities? Of course, no, not at all. Instead, he replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you, Sanhedrin, or to him? We cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Acts 4, 18 to 20. Wow. So are we going to say, um, St. Peter, you, you've just now broken the law and you've gone against the government? Are we? So who commanded St. Peter to go and preach to the whole nations? Jesus Christ, who is God. He said, no, no, no. God is ought to be listened to more than you. There you go. The Bible is very clear. We respect governments as long as they protect and preserve our rights, not make us slaves. That is not a government that is doing the work of God on earth. It is not. As Christians, we have the right to oppose that. And whatever the cost is, so be it. I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to hide and be hypocrite just in order to please governments. I'm here to please my Jesus, no one else. And if nobody likes that, well, tough luck. With all love, I'm saying this, believe me. Jesus is ought to be respected and honored and worshipped first and foremost. Then everyone else comes later. This perfect God, perfect man. He is ought to be worshipped. He's ought to be adhered to. He's ought to be respected. We, I need to bow before my God. Before I respect anyone else. This is the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. So help you Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because when you, start, when you stand in the court of God. It is nothing. It is absolutely. When you stand in the court of this world. It is nothing compared to when you stand in the court of Jesus Christ. I can assure you there. No one can come to your rescue. If Jesus is not your defense. You are in deep trouble my friend. Neither your wealth. Nor your treasure. Nor your fame, your rank, your position, nothing will come to your rescue unless Jesus is the defender of you and the court of God. There is no QC, there is no barrister, there is no lawyer that can come to your rescue. Jesus must be your lawyer, my dear friend. And for Jesus to defend you, only one way Jesus will defend you. When you when you come and confess your sins before the Almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth and say to the Lord, I have sinned before you and heaven. I am not worthy to be called your son. Make me one of those hired people in your, in your, in your, in your mansion, Lord. I'm not worthy. We need to confess and come back to Jesus Christ. Otherwise, the whole world is in trouble, deep trouble. Look at this. The Apostle Paul's real message does not contradict this principle at all. Saint Paul agrees with John the Baptist who went against authorities. Saint Paul agrees with the Lord Jesus, obviously. Because the Lord is his master. <laughs> and St. Paul agrees with St. Peter. Paul wrote, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12, 21. St. Paul's teaching about the authority of governments lives in the shadow of this overarching principle. What is that overarching principle? When governments are evil, Christians must oppose them. When rulers make bad laws, Christians must disobey them. Now, I'd like to read this passage for you. Please pay attention. Now, let's talk about silence. When we see church leaders going silent, when we see church leaders even when they come out and speak, they speak in a very, very weak tone, um, as if they are begging the government to, you know, please, can you be nice to me? You are not representing your Messiah, my dear friend. Therefore, maybe you are not worthy of that position. Maybe you need to step down and give it to someone who has guts. Yeah? A leader that is coward destroys the country, destroys the church. Jesus Christ will definitely will not choose cowards to be in his kingdom. For Jesus was never coward and never will be. The truth fears nothing. The truth will be always sharper than a sword. But with love, you know what? Love is the most powerful thing on earth. It's the foundation. The problem of our time and age, we have abused this love. 
because we've denied the true divine God. That's why we've abused that love. We've abused it. Let's talk about silence. Let's use heroes of the Christian faith as our examples. John the Baptist was not silent. The Lord Jesus was never silent. Saint Peter was not silent. Saint Paul was not silent. Vocal opposition to the government may do damage to friendship, to family relationships, employment opportunities, and personal freedom. Vocal opposition to, to the government may do damage to friendships, family relationships, employment opportunities, and personal freedom. And aren't we witnessing this in our time and age this very day? My goodness, family members have gone against each other. Are you vaccinated or are you unvaccinated? The vaccinated against the unvaccinated. Look what governments have done. Destroyed family bond, destroyed relationships, made employers go against employees. Yet that employer needs to understand one thing, and I'm saying this to every employer. These employees, you've had them working for you for many years. They were very loyal, my dear friend. How could you force them to take a jab unwillingly? How could you do that to this loyal employee of yours? Oh, because the government told you to do so. And then on the other hand, the government comes out and says, well, there is no federal law in this nation to mandate vaccines. There is no mandatory law in this nation. Well, I just want you, my dear government, to explain to me how come it is not mandatory when you are leaving no choice to that poor employee? How come? You've thrown the buck onto the state government and the state government threw it on the employer. To me, that is weakness from the government and this is not a good leadership. If you are a, a true leader, you better stand up there as a man and speak as a man, even if you're a woman. Have guts and take ownership and responsibility. Don't throw it to the next person and hide away. To me, this is, this is weak. I was going to say something else, but I'll leave it as weak. This is weak. But if you allow the Lord Jesus, and every time I just mention his name, I invoke his holy name, I think of his holy name, my goodness. In this name of Jesus, there is power, there is sovereignty, there is freedom, there is sonship, heirs to the kingdom, to the throne, inheritors of the kingdom. The name of Jesus endures forever. The name of Jesus lives forever. The name of Jesus, the fragrance of life forever is the love of my life is my sweetheart I adore Jesus I worship Jesus I love him from the heart for he has given me a drop of his infinite divine love he made me go crazy for him he made me go crazy. When you read in the Song of Solomon, and all love and respect to King Solomon, and I bow before you and I say, in the entire Old Testament, the wisest man ever, he said in the Song of Solomon, he says, tell the one whom I love, I am lovesick. That soul is, re is searching for the, for, the, for the groom. The bride is searching for the groom. She's saying, where are you? I can't find you. Tell him, oh angels, 
Oh, angels of heaven, oh, daughters of Jerusalem, please tell the one I love, I am lovesick. So the ultimate you could reach my beloved King Solomon with all the wisdom you have of the Old Testament, all you could reach the ultimate level is to be love sick. But I say to you with all the ignorance of the New Testament, I the weak, the unworthy, ignorant servant of Christ, I'll say to you, with all your wisdom of the Old Testament, you reached the beginning of the road. I am lovesick, but with the ignorance of the New Testament, I the sinner, the unworthy, I have reached through the grace of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the road. And I'll say, O oh, daughters of Jerusalem, tell the one whom I love the most, I am love crazy for him, not sick. Because when you're sick, you are bedridden. But when you're crazy, you will run in all four corners of the world and you will embrace everyone to bring them to Christ. I am love crazy, not sick. But if you follow the Lord Jesus, this is your path. This is your path to cause damage. You cannot make everyone love you if you are a true follower of Jesus. The day that comes that you make everyone love you, rest assured you are not walking in the Lord's path. For whatever the Lord Jesus has not done, you cannot do, my dear friend. Jesus saw a lot of opposition of his time. Not everybody loved the Lord. And if you're going to walk in his path, guess what? Not everybody's going to love you. This is a very positive sign that you are walking in the Lord's path. So when you see opposition, that's a good sign, my dear friend. You're walking in the Lord's path. Just as our Lord Jesus turned his back on the Pharisees and Sadducees, you may have to turn your back on the religious institutions and leaders that seek to derive benefit from passive, passive silence or active compliance. You need to walk away from those leaders that are seeking to derive benefit from passive silence or active compliance. And this is what we're seeing. Passive silence and active compliance with whatever the government is saying and doing. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I'll read this. Book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. I'll read that again. And the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Who is Jesus Christ? The ruler over all the kings of the earth. He is the ruler over every government on earth. And he who is ought to be listened to first? Jesus before any earthly government. This is the true Christian which St. Paul calls us and urges us to do. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he is the good God. Wow, time flies. We've covered five points out of the 10 points in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter three. We've covered, number one, the enemy. The first thing he put in our hearts, minds, suspicion. Then the woman, she added to the word of God, and she said to the serpent, yes, God said, do not touch the tree and do not eat of it. God never said, do not touch it. God said, do not eat. So when we walk away from God, we begin to add and subtract to his word. And Proverbs 36 says, do not add to his words, or he will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. And number three, the enemy, 
He says, For God knows that in the day you eat of that tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Genesis 3, 5. The enemy put this idea, you're going to be like God. Pride, self-exaltation, very dangerous, my beloved. When you come to serve the Lord, the first thing you ask him, say, Lord, um, pr prevent any false pride coming my way. Protect me from any false pride. For it's the very dangerous thing. When you, when you allow false pride come into you, you can never serve Jesus Christ, my beloved. You can never. And then number four, God, when the enemy said to them, he doesn't want, well, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because when you eat from it, you're going to be like God. Well, God already said that in Genesis 1, 26. Let us go down and make man in our image according to our likeness. Let us make man like us. But the enemy comes and deceives. Number five, when Adam and Eve saw themselves naked, they made coverings out of fig leaves. And God, he made, out of, uh, he made tunics of skin and clothed their nakedness. But the human covered themselves with a fig leaf. And isn't what is happening in the world, isn't governments and so many leaders covering themselves with fig leaves? My beloved, a fig leaf will dry up and then it's going to fall and your nakedness will be revealed once again. You cannot and I cannot cover our nakedness with our, by ourselves. The only one who can cover our nakedness is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We need to go to him and say, we have sinned. Forgive us, my Lord. This is the only way. Now, very quickly, I'm going to go to number six. And hopefully we try and finish the remaining five points. Number six. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Genesis 3, 14 to 15. So when, when Adam broke God's word and ate from the forbidden tree, God went, the first thing he did, he went to Adam. And we see this in Genesis 3.11. The Lord God asked Adam, where are you? And then in Genesis 3.12, Adam blamed God. In Genesis 3.13, God asked the woman and the woman blames the serpent. Genesis 3.14, God curses the serpent. When Adam made a mistake, God went to him first pleading with Adam. What have you done, Adam? Why have you broken my word and eaten from the forbidden tree? Adam, instead of confessing to God and saying sorry, and maybe God would have forgiven him. Instead of saying sorry to God, Adam turns back and blames God and he says, well, the woman which you gave me, she made me fall. It's all your fault, God. Who told you to give me a woman? I was alone. I was living all right. But God out of love said, Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. I need to give you a helper. So is this the way? I show love and in return you blame me and you accuse me to be the reason for your mistake. My goodness, it's always the case, my beloveds. When you show love to others, they always come back and see you as the enemy. But those who are truly enemies to them, they think they are the number one people that love them the most. It's always the case. 
The one who loves us, we don't want him. The one who hates us, that we serve. Jesus loves us, we reject him. Satan hates us, we worship him. The world worships Satan that hates the world. And the one who loves the world, they don't want to know about him. They don't want to acknowledge him. They don't want to even give him a moment of their, la- of their time. Those secret societies, what are you going to gain by f- worshiping Satan? He's laughing at you and he's going to take you to hell and you're going to end up there forever. You're going to miss out on the loving God. Come back, repent. Money can't set you free, my dear friend. Money cannot buy you happiness. You're deceiving yourself and you've been deceived by the enemy. I'm sure you are living in absolute hell right now. Are you comfortable? Do you have inner peace? Impossible. I can guarantee that for you. You can run, but you can't hide. You will never have that inner peace until you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your God. Then you will live in peace from within, not without, from within. Nothing can bring you and give you that inner peace except Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our God. So God goes to Adam. Adam turns and blames God for giving him Eve as a helper. I was being good to you, Adam. Out of love, I gave you someone to comfort you. He said, no, it's your fault, God. So he goes to the woman. Why did he do that woman? She said, the serpent bluffed me. So God goes to the serpent and curses the serpent. God did not curse Adam. God did not curse Eve, but he cursed the serpent because he created Adam to be his son. The father will never curse his son, no matter how wrong the son is. For the love of the father surpasses the love of that son. So when God came to discipline He went to Adam first, then to Eve, then to the serpent. When God came to pass judgment, he went to the serpent, he went to the woman, and he went to Adam. The other way around. When God came to discipline, to to make us realize our mistake and try to fix our mistake, he came to Adam, then Eve, then the serpent. But when all of them failed and blamed God for it, then God came to pass judgment. And when he came to pass judgment, the merciful God, the loving God, did not come to pass the judgment to Adam since he is his son. He went to the serpent first, then to the woman, then last Adam. God delays his judgment, but God never delays his mercy and compassion. When God wants to correct us, he will run to us. When God has no other choice but to judge us, he will slow it as much as possible, as much as he can. Because he is daddy, and daddy never wants ever to hurt his own children. That's why the judgment was passed to the serpent first, then the woman, and then Adam. He said to the serpent, you are cursed on your belly, you will crawl and dust of the earth you will eat. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Genesis 3.16. So, I'll multiply your sorrow and your conception. And in pain you shall bring forth children. To Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground 
not Adam. Cursed is the ground for, you, for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Genesis 3, 17 to 18. Adam, because you broke my word, and I want to focus on this. Because you broke my word, the earth, the ground is condemned, is cursed. And it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. It's going to bring forth for you, Adam, thorns and thistles. Genesis 3, 17 to 18. Thorns and thistles, very briefly. Thorns is a shrub. Thistles is also a shrub. They both bring out thorns. There is a difference, however. A, th a thorn is a shrub planted in a place that goes nowhere. I need to walk all the way to that shrub, and if I step on it, when I am pricked by that thorn, I am in a lot of pain. So what is a thorn? It is a plant where I walk to it myself and step on it and hurt myself. On the other hand, a thistle is also a shrub that brings out thorns, but at, at the head, the, the flower of it is full of th small thorns. It is so light when the wind blows, that flowery, thorny head gets blown away by the wind and it travels all the way where I am and it clings on my clothes and fills my clothes with thousands of small tiny thorns. So a thorn is a shrub that I go to and step on it and I hurt myself. A thistle, it comes to me. So one I go to, the other comes to me. The Lord God said to Adam, because you broke my word, the ground is cursed. It will bring forth thorns and thistles. Thorns, you walk to it. Thistles comes all the way to you. These are the two sins that every human being, whether you are a Christian or not, beside your faith, these are the two sins that every human being, Adam and all the children of Adam, every human being, regardless of your religion, your race, your color, and your background, all of us have failed to overcome these two sins, one called thorns, the other called thistle. We have failed to overcome them. There is one sin that comes all the way to me, and there is another sin, I go all the way to it. One sin is called a thief. The other sin is called a robber. What is the difference between a thief and a robber? Well, they both steal, but there is a difference. They both steal, but there is a difference. A thief comes to my house and robs me. The robber, I go all the way to him and robs me. So the robber is the thorn. I go all the way to it and I get robbed by that thorn. And we see that in the parable where the Lord Jesus says, a certain man was coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Who came and confronted that man along the way? Robbers, not thieves. When we read the Holy Bible, we need to pay extremely close attention because everything has a meaning. The author is the Holy Spirit, the source of wisdom, God himself. A certain man was coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers came along the way. They bashed him up. They... they, they um, they cut him open, he was bleeding, they made him naked and threw him on the side of the road between death and alive. Then that Samaritan came and showed compassion on that man. He, he poured uh, uh, wine 
and oil and bandaged his wounds and he put him on that mule and took him to the inn to the hotel and said to the owner here is two denarii I want you to spend them to spend them all on this man and whatever you spend more on my second coming I'll pay you till the last penny you've spent extra now the thorn is the robber the thistle comes all the way to me is the thief one sin comes to this home and robs it another sin i go all the way to it and robs me first sin comes as a thought the sec the following sin comes as an action when i get this thought in my head and i follow through with this thought then when i follow through with it it is going to transfigure into an action and leads me to the robber Imagine this I'm sitting at home with my family and the thought comes in my head and says to me you've just hit the jackpot in Star City Casino and I'm enjoying my family's company wife children and we're talking we're laughing and all of a sudden this thought comes and says go to Star City Casino you're going to hit the jackpot and I went through with this thought what happened I got up, I changed, I left my family, I put money in my pocket which I should have spent on my family and I went to the robber. The thistle came, the thief brainwashed me, stole everything inside of this house, made me get up. When I got up and walked, I went all the way to the robber thorn, the Star City Casino. Instead of getting the jackpot, the jackpot got me. I walked out of the Star City Casino like Thomas the Tank, too, too empty, steaming out of anger and frustration. I just spend my wages on gambling the house of Satan. I got stripped by the robber, Star City Casino, the thorn. I got, I came out bleeding. I was bruised. I was cut. I came out broken. I was left on the wayside between death and life what do i tell my family i don't have a face to go and face them these two sins thought and action every human being failed no one was able to protect their thinking from evil thoughts and no one was able to stop their actions of evilness all of us failed through our thinking and through our actions. The thistle thought, the action thorn. Adam, because you broke my word, two sins shall come forth. Thought and action. You'll never be able to overcome them, Adam. But until I come and put on the flesh, Adam, in the end of times, and when Jesus Christ appeared in the end of times, all glory to his holy name. What did the Lord Jesus say in the New Testament when we read in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 42? Look at the sweetheart of all sweethearts, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Luke 6, 44. For men do not gather figs from thorns. Wow. Nor do they gather grapes from bramble bush or thistles. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from thistles. Jesus, our Lord, was quoting Genesis 3, 17 to 18. For no men plug out of plug figs out of thorns nor do they gather grapes from thistles figs out of thorns grapes out of thistles no one well a thorn shrub will only give thorns a thistle shrub will only give thistles thorns so obviously you cannot plug out of thorns figs and you cannot plug out of thistles grapes but what is impossible to men is possible to God Jesus Christ of Nazareth who is God revealed in the flesh 
the true divine God. What is impossible to man is possible to me, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I plugged out of thorns, figs, and out of thistles, grapes. My goodness, when the Lord Jesus was nailed on the cross and the Lord was crucified, the Lord Jesus took the thorns, robber, and took the thistles, thief, took your evil action and took your evil thinking, took the thorns and the thistles and made out of them a crown of thorns and placed it on his head. And why a crown of thorns was placed on his head? Because your thought became evil when you broke God's word. God came to cleanse your way of thinking, to purify your way of thinking. That's why his head was pierced with thorns in order for your head and my head be cleansed and purified of evilness. Thistles. And when he crowned himself with that thorn and thistles out of the cross, he gave us figs <laughs> and he gave us grapes. Figs, the last supper, he got up, he took that bread, he thanked, he blessed and he thanked and he said, and he broke that bread and he said, take and eat of it for this is my body. Figs, body of Christ. And he took the cup and he said, drink of it for this is my blood that is being shared for the remission of the sins of the world. It is out of the grapes gave us his blood. The Holy Eucharist, the body and the blood of Christ in the truth. Not in a symbolic way, it's in the truth. It is through the body and the blood of Christ only we are able to overcome thorns and thistles. Only we are able to overcome robbers and thieves. Only we are able to overcome evil thoughts and evil deeds. It is the body and the blood of Christ. That's why Satan, he will do anything in his power to stop you from receiving the body and the blood in the truth. Because it is the body and the blood of Christ that washes away the thorns and the thistles that that cursed ground gave forth to Adam and all of his descendants. Every human being fails with thinking, fails with action. Jesus Christ gave us his body and blood. Do they plug out of thorns figs? He said, yes, I've done it. Do they plug out of thistles grapes? He said, yes, I've done it. The crown of thorns and thistles I put on my head and from the cross I gave you my body and I gave you my blood. Do this for the remission of the sins. When we receive him in the truth, we've done quite a lengthy lecture on this you can find it on YouTube I believe is that right correct you can find it on YouTube um, the body and the blood of Christ why did he give his body in the element of bread and why did he give his blood in the element of grapes why these two why why grapes why why bread They have deep, 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 profound meanings, my beloveds. But it is the truth. I'll say this. Adam failed. There is no escape from these two sins, thought and action. The only escape is when you receive the body and the blood in the truth, not symbolic, in the truth. Let me explain. I won't take too much of your time, maybe 10 hours, it's nothing, yeah? Got on your bishop, as if we don't have anything else to do, eh? 
Well done, brother. We love you, Bishop. <laughs> um, and the truth. Amazing. When you read in the Gospel of St. John, you will never see in the Gospel of St. John, the Lord Jesus referring to himself as the reality. Everywhere in the Gospel of John, when you read, the Lord Jesus refers to himself as the truth, not reality. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What wasn't the Lord Jesus enough knowledgeable in the Aramaic and the, and the Hebrew language to say other words besides truth? Didn't the Lord Jesus know that there was a word that existed called reality? I'm sure he knew. Now, since the Lord Jesus is God revealed in the flesh, he is the source of wisdom. So the Lord Jesus does not say anything fluke, does not say anything out of thin air. Everything the Lord says has deep, profound theological meanings. So when the Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he was deliberate in when he said, and he knew exactly what he was saying. And he meant it, my beloveds. And when the Lord Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 6 said that this bread is truly, when you read in the original text, now some interpretation uses the word indeed. Indeed is not 100% accurate. It should have been truly instead of indeed. Because when you read in the original text, in the Greek and the Aramaic, you will find the word truth being used, not indeed. So we need to be very specific. And we thank the Lord we have the original text. So when you go to the original text of the New Testament, the Lord Jesus says, and this bread is truly my body. And this wine is truly my blood. He used the word truth. What is the difference between truth and reality? One thing. Reality is everything under the time. Reality is everything that is under the time. Truth, everything that is above the time. Reality, everything that is under the time. Truth, everything that is above the time. You and I, we call this reality. We can never claim we are in the truth. Why? Because time controls us. Everything that is under the time is reality. And being under the time, meaning the time has control over reality. Therefore, this meeting, this gathering we have is called reality. Why? Because after a little while, I have to go, you're going to go. This reality is going to change. So, since reality is under the time, therefore, reality changes. Truth never changes. Because truth is above the time. What makes a thing change is time. When that thing is above the time, never changes. Since there is no time, there is no change, isn't it? There is no past, there is no present, there is no future. It's just present, so it'll never change. So reality is under the time. Therefore, reality changes, and truth being above the time never changes. The question is, who is above the time? the creator of time who is the creator of time god but when the lord jesus spoke in john 6 he was referring to his body as the truth god is spirit god doesn't have a body so the lord is referring to his body as being the truth this bread is truly my body this wine is truly my blood he is referring to his body the man, Jesus, is the truth. Not the divine. The divine is already the truth. But he's saying to his body, the truth. Wow. So his body is above the time. Above the time is the truth. And above the time, there is no time. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow is always today. 
the Lord Jesus sacrificed his body and the truth above the time when he gave his body and blood he gave it in the truth and the truth meaning it's above the time above the time there is no time what is under the time I don't have the time <laughs> what is under the time Adam because you broke my word the earth is condemned and it shall bring forth thistles and braes th two sins robber and thief thistles and braes are under the time the two sins are under the time and there is no escape from it whether you are a Christian or not it's beside the point every human being fails with their evil thinking and with their evil deeds every one of us has failed and will always fail so the Lord came he said do they plug out of thorns figs do they plug out of thistles grapes he said yes I did it on the cross I gave you the fig my body I gave you the grapes my blood my body is the truth and my blood is the truth this bread is truly my body and this wine is truly my blood the body and the blood that I gave you on Calvary is the truth why because I came to deal with two sins that all of you have failed in the thought and the action through my body you de I dealt with your evil action and through my blood I dealt with your evil thinking every time you've sinned with thought and every time you've sinned with deed come and receive the true body and the true blood of Christ the king and when you receive the body and the blood since it is the truth it will take you from under the time and put you above the time where the truth is and when you are above the time there is no more thorns robbers there is no more thistles thieves there is no more evil action thorns there is no more evil thoughts thistles the body and the blood of Christ elevated me from reality and took me into the truth and that is why when Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross over 2020 years ago he only had to do it once you know why because his sacrifice is above the time the truth and above the time there is no time so whatever he sacrificed he did it forever so it wasn't Jesus sacrificed himself yesterday because above the time there is no yesterday yesterday today and tomorrow is today always is it is a continuous present tense I don't have the time to talk more I'll leave you with this the body and the blood are the backbone of the church the spine of the church you take the body and the blood the body cannot stand without a spine Satan the enemy he will do anything and everything to take away the body and the blood from you you can sing for as long as you want but don't receive the body and the blood I'll ask you this and think about it <laughs> I love you all don't be offended huh <laughs> this is the truth I'll ask you this who crushed the head of the serpent on Calvary was it the son of God or the son of man if you're gonna tell me the son of God crushed the head of the serpent I'll tell you no oh sorry my dear friend the son of God is God and God will never fight his own creation it will it would be an unfair battle of course the creation cannot overcome the creator it's an unfair battle but it was the son of man who crushed the head of the serpent divinity was there with him always never never left him but divinity did not interfere with the battle left it to the man the perfect man Jesus 
being slain, being ripped apart, nailed on the cross, in his most weakest moment, he crushed the head of the serpent in its most powerful moment. He went into the territory of Satan. That's why the sun disappeared at 12 noon till 3 p.m. It went darkness. Why did it go darkness? Because that is the territory of Satan. Light is the territory of Jesus Christ. That's why the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to come and I'm not, I'm going to overcome you, Satan, in my weakest form. Not like the former Adam. The former Adam was in paradise and failed. The latter Adam went in hell and, 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 and succeeded. He went into the territory of Satan, darkness. And on top of that, he was nailed on the cross, can't move. His body was shredded from those whips and lashes of the Roman soldiers. He was on his last breath and in his weakest moment in the territory of Satan, in his strongest moment, Satan, Jesus, the weakest moment of his life, crushed the head of the serpent in the flesh. That's why Satan hates people when they receive the body and the blood. He's trying frantically to close the churches. Look how he's talking to governments. Look, he's always talking to health ministers. Yeah, the, the church will be reopened soon, but only to the vaccinated. Because this is, this is the language of Satan. I'm not talking about these people, but I'm saying Satan, look how he is talking through them. Even Simon, when the Lord Jesus said, I'm going to be crucified, he said, far from you, Lord, I will not let you be crucified. He said, away with me, Satan. Satan spoke through Simon. So the Lord rebuked Satan who spoke through Simon. And we need, in the name of Jesus Christ, to rebuke Satan who is speaking through these so-called government leaders, politicians, and church leaders. If they speak wrongly, they need to be rebuked. That Satan that is speaking through them needs to be rebuked in Jesus' mighty name. Well, the Lord in the flesh, the Son of Man, crushed the head of the serpent. This is my body. This is my blood. I give to you in the truth above the time. That's why the sacrifice is only made once and once forever. So when we celebrate the Holy Mass every Sunday and whenever we celebrate the Holy Mass, we are not re-crucifying Christ. We're not. We are remembering what he had done over 2,000 years ago in the truth above the time. And since it's above the time, he can only do it once. Because there is no tomorrow to do it again. And there is not, no the other day to do it again. There is no tomorrow. There is no yesterday. There is always present tense. So since it's a present tense forever, what he's done over 2,000 years ago, he's doing it now. He's going to do it another 200 million years ago. Whatever time it takes, he's done it once and once and for all. But I'm remembering along with him, because the honor of the body is present. When I take that body, the honor of the body is present now, not 2,000 years ago. Christ is God. He is everywhere. He is present everywhere. So the honor of the body is present with me now on the altar. So when the honor of the body is present, it is not symbolic. It is in the truth. Symbolic is when the honor of that thing is, in, is missing. Then it's a symbol. I have, a, I have a photo of a loved one to my heart. I put it in my wallet. That loved one lives in America. I get busy. Life is, is very busy. So I forget sometimes. I forget about him. Every time I open the wallet, I see the photo. I remember. That's what the Lord Jesus said. Remember me. Re do this in my remembrance. When I see the photo, I remember that person. But imagine this, that person flies from America and comes to see me in person. And he's sitting next to me on the couch and I open the wallet. I look at the, at the, at the photo. 
Do I ignore the person and look at the photo only? Or what do I do? I turn to the person and I say, remember when we took this photo together? But now it is not symbolic because the owner of the photo is present with me in the flesh. When I take that body on the altar, the owner of the body is not absent. He is present with me today. So what do I do? I say, Lord, remember what you did for me on Calvary over 2000 years ago. But it's not symbolic. The owner is here now. Jesus plugged out of thorns, gave us his body and out of thistles, gave us his blood, grapes to take us above the time where there is no time, there is no place. And I'm running out of time, my beloved. When you come to receive the body and the blood, you come with a contrite heart, with a, with a spirit that is, that is coming in humility, seeking the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus, the mercy of Christ. Say, Lord, forgive me my sins and make me worthy to receive you in the body and the blood and the truth, the Holy Eucharist, to, re to wash away my sins, both thorns and thistles, robbers and thieves, the action and the, de and the thought of my evilness. And take me up above the time. And above the time, there is one thing, eternity. Give me eternal life through the body and the blood, my Lord. And lastly, point number nine, and we're going to finish it very quickly. The Lord God, the Lord God, then, then um, the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Genesis 3.22. That rib that he took from the side of Adam, he, he, created, he made a woman and he brought her to the man. I'll give you this insight to those who are not familiar with the Aramaic or Syriac language. When you read the Holy Bible in the Aramaic language, the word brought her to him, the word brought her in Aramaic, it is called Atta, Atta. So what was the name of Eve prior to the fall? Her name was Atta, was not Eve. She was called Eve after she got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And Eve means the mother of all life. She gave birth to children. She became the mother of all life. But prior to the fall, for as long as they were in the Garden of Eden, Eve was not her name. Her name was Atta. And Atta was the name given to her by God himself. And the word Atta is a compounded word. Two in one. At, meaning you, ta, come. So God called her, you come. Atta, at, you, come. Ta, meaning come. Atta, you come. Why did he call her this? Because when he made her, he said, you come and show yourself to Adam to see if Adam is going to fall in love with you and marry you. Even in marriage, even the partner that is chosen by God for you, God will not force you to marry that person. Because marriage is based on love. And wherever there is true love, there is freedom. And wherever there is freedom, there is a choice. Wherever there is a choice, there is a will. Love is not mandatory. It is a choice. Even the partner in marriage, which God himself has chosen for you, will not force you to marry that person because marriage is based on love and love has freedom. So her name was, you come. Isn't that wonderful? What's your name? You come. No, no, you come. <laughs> no, 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 my name is you come. <laughs> oh my goodness. And Adam said, number 10, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 
This is the matrimonial bond where the two are no longer two, but they are one in Jesus Christ. This is a bone of my bones and a flesh of my flesh. Therefore, the man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Why? Because father and mother are not his body, but the wife is his body and the man is the head of this body. That's why he needs to leave. It doesn't mean that he needs to deny his parents once he gets married. No, because the law still stands, the commandment, respect father and mother so that I can bless you and give you a long life. That stands forever. We need to respect mom and dad before and after we get married. But why do we need to leave them here? Because mom and dad are not my body. The wife is my body and I am the head the man, the head of this body, my wife. Therefore, the head and the body cannot be separated. The head can't go on its own without a body, and the body can't leave without a head. Wherever the wife goes, even if she goes alone, the head is with her. And whenever the man leaves, even if he goes alone, the body is with him. Yes? Good. Probably some of you are thinking about this, eh? Mm -hmm. Good. Think about it. The two are one. God is amazing in his mathematics. When you go to the school, the mathematics of this world, they teach you one plus one equals two, isn't it? God says one plus one equals one, but a, a better and stronger one. So God's mathematics is different. One plus one equals one, but a better and a stronger one. Adam, it is not good for you to be alone. You need a partner. You need a helper. You need a comforter. When you fall, she sustains you. When you cry, she embraces you. When you're weak, she supports you. That's why I gave you Eve. How could you say it is your fault, God? Out of love, I gave you someone to, to be comforting for you. And all I get in return is a blame. My beloved, we should never ever blame God. That's a very naughty thing to do. If anything, we seek God's forgiveness and mercy. For everything I've done, it was my choice. It was my doing. God has nothing to do with it. He gave me love, freedom, choice, and, and options, and a will to decide out of love, out of respect. And today, governments, they want to take that freedom of choice from me. And you say, we need to adhere to such rules? These rules are evil, my dear governments. For God gave me that freedom. You cannot take it from me. Love one another, embrace one another, husbands and wives. You are one in love and respect, not in duties. The man's duties are different to the woman's. We should never mix between being one in love and respect and duties. Duties are different, but in love and respect we are one. But we are not one in duties, my beloved. The woman can never be a man, and the man can never be a woman. The man is driven by logic. The woman is driven by feelings and emotions. Let us not fight over duties. We're wasting each other's time and God's time. We should be one in love and respect. We've concluded chapter three after eight uh, lectures. May the Lord Jesus bless you. May the Lord Jesus guide you and protect you. I pray that we have learned something today. I pray that the Lord Jesus has touched our hearts and enlightened our souls to realize where his truth lies and to realize and discern what his will is in my life and your life. The purpose, the very purpose why he created us and brought us into existence here, my beloved. 
um, we've been receiving a lot of requests to do uh, commentary on the book of Revelation in English. We did start on chapter 1 of Revelation a few months ago, but we stopped because of this uh, new program called Journey with Christ. Uh, I, we found that it was relevant to talk about this, but I believe we may have one more session uh, with this Journey with Christ. So maybe, maybe, maybe next Friday we'll do one more session of Journey with Christ. And then after that, we will go back to the commentary of the book of Revelation in English, as so many people have requested. We love you very much, and we respect your requests, and we will adhere to them very, very, very soon. God bless you. God protect you. Again, a reminder, next Wednesday, we are starting a new program called Spirit of a Servant. Send your questions to the email address appearing on the screen because we will be answering those questions on those Wednesdays. There will be a small um, uh, prayer uh, time. We pray together and then we'll start answering some questions and there will be other, um, other matters we will be discussing in relation to a spirit of a servant how we should be servants in the, law, in the house of the Lord. God bless you. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I took too much of your time, and I thank the Lord for it. And I'm very, very happy. May the Lord Jesus bless you and guide you and protect you. I'll say this joke. Um, instead of being serious all the time, I don't like it. We need to break the ice a little bit and, and be um, of good cheer and, uh, and easygoing. Bit of a, you know, a, sense, um, a sense of humor, as they say. Um, this little boy went to his mom. Now, dads, fathers, uh, this is for you. Don't say everything in front of your children. They'll get you into trouble. So this little boy went to his mom and he said, Mom, she said, yes, my darling. What is an angel? She said, well, my son, an angel is a spiritual, illuminative being that flies. He said, but mom, I heard my dad the other day saying to his secretary, you are my angel, but she doesn't fly. She said, my son, rest assured, today she will fly. <laughs> uh, good on you, dad. Don't ever say to your secretary, you are my angel, when you have an angel at home waiting for you. You'll get into deep trouble, brother. Deep trouble. So God bless you, and uh, may the Lord Jesus always be with you. And please, let us stand for the finale prayer, if you don't mind. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you all the days of your lives, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. The peace of Christ be with you always, my beloved. God bless.